So hello and welcome everyone to our latest UCI Alumni Adulting for Anteaters event. Uh, this is a quarterly program that we put on built specifically for UCI young alumni with a wide variety of topics and it's tax season. So we wanted to invite a beloved lecturer, Max Chow to join us today, to help demystify the world of personal taxes. So I'm Chris Nelson. I'm a 2013 graduate from UCI and I'm a member of the, the Young Alumni Council here, which is a group of volunteers made up of graduates in the last 10 years that helps guide the Alumni Association on strategy to help engage recent alumni. Professionally, I'm a CPA, so I think that's how I ended up hosting this. I don't do anything with taxes, uh, so this event will be as helpful for me to do my own taxes as everyone else. Uh, the UCI alumni website has a lot of virtual resources uh, that lets you connect with your fellow alumni. We have an events calendar, we have a library of past programs, we have mentoring on the Anteater Network and more. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, we're going to have everyone muted for this in order to eliminate background noise and interference, but we'd love for you to participate as the event goes along. You can use the Q&A to ask questions. We'll monitor that and try to get anything answered live or a Q&A at the end uh, or the chat function just to chat with people that are here. Um, with that being said, I'd like to introduce Max Chow. He's a lecturer at the UC Irvine Paul Mirage School of Business. Personally, he is one of my favorite professors on campus. Uh, he has a vast experience working in both the legal and financial arenas. He spent time with Big Four Accounting. He's worked for law firms, do, law firms doing corporate and real estate transactions, income tax planning. He established his own tax practice or own law practice, uh, which serves a wide range of clients. And he's also served on the board of directors for various nonprofit entities around Orange County and several high tech companies. Um, prior to arriving at UCI, he received his Bachelor of Arts degree with in cum laude from Cal State Fullerton and later received his JD from USC. He was UCI Lecturer of the Year for 2018 and 2021 as well, and he is the only two-time winner. Uh, with that said, let's give him a big welcome and I will kick it over to him. Take it away, Max. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I know taxes are difficult or scary for a lot of people, so we thought we'd put together this presentation to help you understand taxes a little bit better. So I'm going to share my screen here. And to start off with, before we even start with my presentation, and you guys can type this in the chat window, is I want you to tell me how you feel when someone says the word taxes to you or income taxes. If you can type in the chat window, what are some of the things that, some adjectives or words that come to mind when you hear that? So I'm gonna need some help from all of you um, to, okay, so Arlene's saying complicated or Chris says inconvenience, Bryce says dread, Ryan says unexcited, uh, Twee says there's some anxiety out there, confusing, intimidating, complicated, yeah, I think these are a lot of the a lot of the feelings everyone has about taxes, and they're always worried about tax season when they come up. So we're going to start with something the basics for you right now. So the basics we're going to give you just some detailed information on what you do with your taxes during this tax filing season, and then we're going to start talking about some strategies and things that you can do to help minimize your taxes. So. Who must file taxes is the most basic question we have out here. Well, individuals. So if you're an individual and you receive significant income, which we would describe as being greater than your standard deduction, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, or you are self-employed and you have net self-employment earnings of $400 or more. If you meet either one of these criteria, you have to be filing your taxes regardless of whether you actually owe the taxes or not. So when are taxes due? Well, everyone knows the date generally here in the United States. April 15th is the magic date. We're about, what, 17 days away from tax filing season this year. Now, April 15th is the filing deadline. 
There is a six month extension generally available till October 15th to file your taxes. However, the extension does not extend your deadline to pay your taxes. So all taxes must be paid by April 15th, even if you extend it to October 15th to actually do the filing. So it means by April 15th, you have to have a pretty good estimate as to what you think your taxes are gonna be. Because if you don't pay the correct amount, you underpay, you're going to have to uh, suffer some penalties out there. So those are just some of your basics here. What tax form do we use? So most of us know in the United States, we use the form 1040. That's the form every one of us use to file our taxes out there. And what the tax, oh, Lucia says it is Monday, April 18th this year. It most certainly is. Um, it is the fifth, uh, April 15th falls on a Friday this year, but they've extended it to Monday because I think there's a holiday somewhere on the East Coast that impacts the filing and they never do the deadlines on Saturday or Sunday. So that's why it's extended till Monday the 18th. Okay. Um, Wesley, I wish tax day would be a national holiday. It would make my life a lot easier, but I don't think most people would be happy with, uh, with having a holiday to commemorate the payment of taxes. So form 1040 is the form that everyone uses to file your taxes. And in general, the form 1040 parallels what we call the tax formula. And so I'm going to give you a simplified tax formula here. We start off with our, your income, you subtract out your deductions, and that will equal taxable income. You take your taxable income, you multiply that by your tax rate, and that equals your tax owed. From the tax owed, you're going to subtract out your tax credits, and then once you do that, you get your either owed or you get a refund. Now, someone did ask a question here, is it good to receive a refund or not? That depends. It really depends upon your perspective here. So do you want to give the government interest-free use of your money for however many months? Most people will say no, therefore refunds probably a bad thing, but it could be a good thing because if you don't have the discipline to save your money and pay your taxes on time, you potentially are now going to suffer penalties out there. So as a result, just keep in mind um, whether you want to get a refund or whether you want to owe taxes on April 15th, that's going to be up to you as to what your perspective is on that. Hey, Arlene, just to let you know, we're going to release the slide decks to you. So you're going to be able to get those slide decks as well. Okay, so there's your basic tax formula that we're going to be using to kind of just go through this presentation to give you some tips and strategies that we can use to help reduce your taxes. Now, before we get there, we got to talk to you about our tax system here. So we have a pay-as-you-go system in the United States. And the pay-as-you-go system means as you earn income, you should be prepaying your income taxes. Why would we have a system like this in place? I got a simple answer for you. The IRS knows we are Americans. And what are Americans famous for? Spending money. Hey, I just got a bonus. I'm going to go buy a new car. Hey, I just got a raise. I'm going to go buy a new house out there. The IRS knows we are not very good savers. So as a result, we have this system where you have, as you earn your income, you have to contribute into the tax system as well. So uh, there's a question, where do deductions fall? It's income minus your deductions will equal your taxable income. Um, and someone's also asking, how do you qualify for more tax deductions or tax credits when you're single or married with no kids? We're actually going to talk about that. So we'll get to that question in a little bit as well. So here's, um, here's your pay-as-you-go system. We have two methods in which we pay as you go. The first one is withholding on your paycheck. If you're an employee, they are taking money out of your paycheck already to help you prepay your taxes. And so when you are an employee, you're generally going to fill out a Form W-4 that's going to ask for your filing status. It's going to ask how many withholdings you want to take out of your paycheck. The more withholdings you choose out of your paychecks, it means the, uh, the higher your paycheck is, the less amount of tax. 
the lower amount of withholdings you take, it means they'll take more out of your paycheck and you'll get a smaller paycheck. So the tip for you is if you want a bigger paycheck, meaning actual cash, increase the number of your withholdings. But be really, really careful because if you take a big paycheck right now, now you're going to potentially owe taxes on April 15th. And you got to make sure that you have enough cash set aside on April 15th to pay those taxes. So that's the first way you pay as you go in the United States, withholding on paychecks. The second way you do it is you make voluntary estimated tax payments. If you have a lot of other income, such as interests or dividends or capital gains or things for which taxes are not already withheld, you have to make voluntary estimated tax payments. And if you don't do it, you will be penalized for not making those payments. So be careful on that, that if you are required to make estimated tax payments, that you do so on time and you pay the correct amount. It means that by April 15th, you have to have a good estimate as to what you think your total income might be. Um, so just be careful of that. You got to do a good estimate on that. Uh, Twee's asking, what's the difference between single and head of household? Single, as I would say, is you might be unlucky in love. It means you're filing as one person. A head of household means that you are single, you are not married, but you are supporting some children or some dependents out there. And then we consider you to be a head of household. So these are your two methods in which you can pay as you go. Now, let's give you some information about the income tax brackets that you have to watch out for for your IRS federal taxes. In the United States, we have something called a progressive or a graduated tax. What that means is that as your income goes up, your tax rate goes up as well. And our tax rates in the United States range from 0%, some people don't have to pay any taxes, to 37%, which is our highest individual income tax rate right now. And so where you fall in there depends upon your marginal tax rate. What a marginal tax rate means is that at this lower bracket of income, you're paying it at the lower tax rate. But as your income moves up, the next increase in your income will be taxed at a slightly higher rate. And then as your income goes up higher, it's taxed at a higher rate. So it's not the whole thing is taxed at the higher rate. It's just the marginal portions that you increase. That's what's going to be taxed at the higher tax rate. So 0% on the low end, 37% on the high end um, for our income tax rates for federal. Don't forget, you probably have state income taxes as well. If you live here in California, minimums California state income tax rate 9.3%, and that increases in 1% increments based upon your income. And there's a potential surtax that would get your California rate up to a maximum of 12.3%. So just kind of keep that in mind. You got an IRS rate and you got a California rate or a state income tax rate that you have to pay, okay? Um, as Chris is saying, you want to adjust your withholdings based upon your total income that you expect for the year. And you do want to get it tried to as close to zero as you can, because that means on April 15th, you're not writing them a check or letting them take money out of your bank account, but you're also not getting a big refund at that point. I will tell you from our perspective, we kind of like the big refund on April 15th because it's money we had already socked away. And now we got a big slug of money and we can go buy something expensive that we didn't really have to save up for. Okay, so those are the basics um, on taxes that we have in the United States. So now let's go through some strategies for you to minimize your taxes. Well, strategies to legally minimize your tax. There's a lot of illegal crap that you can do, and I don't recommend doing that. Here's some legal ones that you can take to try to reduce your taxes. So first one is reduce your income. So there's our tax formula down below. And so we're going to focus on our income right now. And the first strategy is let's reduce your income because that will reduce your taxable income and reduce the amount of taxes that you have to pay. So now what is considered income. Hey, Raymond's asking a quick question here. Is that why people move to different states for different tax rates? Um, that is some reasons why some people move um, state to state. There are states out there that do not have a state income tax. 
Um, and so people move there, believe that their dollar goes farther there. Their, the gross pay they might receive in that state might be lower than what they would receive in a, another state that has a tax out there. So it's a balance that you just wanna, um, that you wanna check out. Okay, so what's considered income? Income is anything that you earn. And you know what? As United States citizens, or even green card permanent residents of the United States, we have the absolute privilege that all of our income, no matter where we earn it, whether it's in the United States or outside the United States, it's subject to tax in the United States. It's our privilege that we get to include everything we earn as part of our income. So what are some examples of income? Well, if you're an employee, the wages that you earn, that's income. Um, if you're self-employed, that's considered income that you would have to put on your taxes. Maybe you earn some interest and dividends out there, that's considered income as well. Or maybe you have rental income, some properties you're renting out, that income, oh, that rental income is considered income as well. Capital gains, if you sell certain assets at a profit, those capital gains are part of your income. Here's one you gotta watch out for. If you owe money to someone and they forgive that debt, that's considered income as well too. Maybe you're a really good gambler. You play the lottery, you go to Vegas or you win those, uh, those, uh, those football pools out there. Any net gambling winnings you have, those are considered income as well. Now, Chris mentioned that I'm UCI's 2018 Lecture of the Year and the 2021 Lecture of the Year. I win a stipend. I win um, this nice little glass plaque as well. Guess what? That potentially is income to me as well. So when you win a prize and award, you have to recognize that as income as well. So Lucia is saying, hey, she owns a wedding photo business. In addition to her day job, can a client 1099 me for this wedding? Um, the client certainly can. The client is trying to deduct what they pay you uh, related to the services you provided them. I don't know if it's a legitimate deduction or not, but I'll tell you, Lucia, if they 1099 you with that income, it's income to you and you have to report it as well. Twe saying, with regards to debt, does the federal loan forgiveness for public service count towards income? There are specific exceptions on debt forgiveness, and that is one of the exceptions. If it's statutory where they've said that that forgiveness is not included as part of income, we don't include it as income. For example, if you have student loans that are forgiven because you participate in one of the public service programs, um, I can't remember their names. There's one if you go outside the country, there's one of uh, AmeriCares, I think, um, or if you stay in the United States, those specifically, those are debt forgiveness programs and those are not included as income as well. Avery saying, how about financial assistance from the family during COVID? Um, if they're making gifts to you as financial assistance, um, as long as it doesn't exceed about $16,000 a year, it's not considered income to you um, at all. So these are just some general examples of what income uh, is that we would include. Uh, Sheila's asking, hey, if you get paid on Venmo, does that count as income? Well, it depends on what you're getting paid for. If you provided a service to someone and they Venmo you, that is income. Um, if you are, they're just reimbursing you for something, Sheila, that then that is not income. If they're repaying a loan, that is not income out there. Um, so just you gotta kind of gotta be careful. And if you think that potentially IRS is not gonna figure out that someone Venmoed you money or wire transferred money to you. I think again, they have access to things like that because the banks and these companies make reports to the IRS about the payments they receive. So my advice to you, if you got the income, don't play the game, report the income and pay the taxes on it. Judy's asking is child support or spousal support income too? Child support Judy is never considered income. However, alimony that you receive from a divorce that occurred prior to 2019, that is considered income. Alimony for divorces that occurred on January 1st, 2019 or later, not income. Okay. So these are just some general types of income that we have out there. So let's talk about one of your first strategies. And that's an employee 
versus an independent contractor. So what is an employee? Well, an employee is an individual who works for a third party and they're generally under the control of that third party. That employee doesn't get to make a lot of decisions. The third party is controlling when they work, where they work, how they work, how much they get paid. You're an employee and employees get periodic paychecks. And so here's an example of a paycheck out there. And I know some of you have asked the question, what is gross pay? What's net pay? What's all the stuff they take out of your paycheck? Based upon the work you perform multiplied by your hourly rate or your monthly salary that they pay you, that is considered your gross pay. But none of us actually get that gross pay as part of our bank accounts. We never don't, we don't get that amount. Instead, what we get is the net pay. Now, what's the difference between the gross pay and the net pay? It's all the withholdings that get taken out of your paycheck that are mandatory. So the first withholding taken out of this paycheck is for Medicare. Medicare is our government um, healthcare system that when you turn 65, you qualify for Medicare and it's the government paying much of your healthcare bills out there. And so since you wanna participate in the Medicare system, you want to have Medicare taken out of your paycheck. The next one is social security tax. So we are funding our future social security receipts. Although I confess, I don't know if social security is gonna be around when you guys are uh, ready to retire. It might be there in some different form, but you're having social security taken out of your paycheck to help fund the retirement system for social security. Remember the pay as you go system? There's your federal income tax withholding. They're taking out that amount from your paycheck now to help you prepay your federal income taxes. California, we got a state income tax as well. So they're also taking out the state income tax uh, too. And then in California, we have a state disability insurance tax that, tax that gets taken out of your paycheck too, that in case you get disabled on the job, it helps fund your disability payments out there. Uh, Jacqueline says, hey, if you received a stimulus check, that does not count on, your in, uh, count on your taxes. Stimulus checks are not income. Those are free gifts from the government. Take them, be happy. You don't have to report them as part of income on your tax return. So approximately what you want to think about when you're when you're doing your paycheck is you want to budget it's roughly around 8.6 percent not including the federal income tax withholdings or the california state income tax withholdings about 8.6 percent that's how much you pay in the medicare social security and your state disability tax itself uh ty's asking why does the uc system not participate in the sdi state actually it's not sdi they do participate in that they don't participate in social security it's a weird thing that the University of California has the arrangement they've made with Social Security is that we don't technically get Social Security out of our UCI paychecks. Well, I, or let me restate that. We do technically get Social Security out of our UCI, uh, being a UCI employee. It's just we don't pay into the, UCI, uh, the Social Security system. Rather, we pay into a UC system that they fund into Social Security. It's the arrangement they've made, but you will be entitled to get Social Security even if you are a UC employee. So if you're um, an employee, you get your periodic paycheck, and then at year end, you get something called a W-2. And the W-2 reports your gross wages on there, box one, and then it reports the Medicare withholdings, the Social Security tax withholdings, um, the federal income tax withholdings, and the state income tax withholdings that um, you paid as well. And so it basically is a summary of your year end of all your gross pays and your net pays out there. So with employees, your taxes are taken out of your paychecks already. You wanna compare that to an independent contractor. An independent contractor is an individual who's working for a third party, but they're independent. They're not an employee. They get to control all aspects of their work, how they work, when they work, what their work hours are, what their billing rates are, where they're gonna work. All this stuff is determined by the independent contractor. In return, they don't get a Form W-2, they get a Form 1099 miscellaneous. And what this does is it reports the total amount that that third party paid to you as the independent contractor. And then what you do is you put it on the Schedule C of your tax return and you report 
the total amounts that you got paid as an independent contractor. But what's great about this is now you can offset that income with business related expenses. So let's go back to our self-employed guy who runs a small restaurant. What kind of business related expenses do you think he would be entitled to deduct on his Schedule C to offset the income that he earns? What kind of expenses do you think? So Chris says wages, yeah, if he pays wages out to his employees, that's deductible. Bryce says the food, the cost of goods sold for the food that he has to buy to serve. Ryan says maybe there's some travel costs that he has out there, maybe to go to a, to a cooking class or maybe to do some research on food. Um, Payal says rent, yeah, if he's paying rent, that's a good one. Payal also says depreciation, that's an expense that he gets to take as well. Um, Judy, if he buys small equipment, he potentially can take that as a full deduction right now. Um, Lucia says transportation costs, rental costs, yeah. And Chris is saying marketing, advertising, absolutely. Mai's talking about some utilities. Yep, those are valid expenses as well. Basically, anything that's reasonable related to that business, they're going to be able to take as a deduction to offset that income. But let me step back here for a minute. Um, with self-employed people, unlike employees, are they having Social Security or Medicare taken out of the 1099 payments they receive? No. Hey, do you think this guy who opened this small restaurant, do you think he wants to get Social Security when he turns 67? Do you think he wants to qualify for Medicare at 65? I think so. How do we make it such that he, as that self-employed individual, can still get Social Security and Medicare? It's because now if you file as, a uh, file as self-employed and you get a 1099 as an independent contractor, you got to pay an extra self-employment tax of 15.3% on top of the regular income tax you, you make. So you got to be careful that switching to be an independent contractor is not necessarily a slam dunk that it's going to save you on taxes compared to an employee. You do kind of have to run the numbers a little bit. So what are the advantages of being an independent contractor? Way more flexibility and control in your work and how you do it. You get to deduct all your business-related expenses to offset your income. Remember, employees don't get to do that. But what are the downsides or disadvantages to being an independent contractor? Potential less job security. You're not an employee. You're not protected by state law. Um, as to how employees get treated. And you're subject to that additional self-employment tax as well. So uh, May Lee saying, hey, she works as a contractor for a company where I receive pay for my insurance through them. Uh, am I an independent contractor? Sounds like you are an independent contractor. Can you deduct your gas? Yeah, absolutely. As long as it's a business-related expense, you can certainly deduct that. Um, Let's see, uh, someone says, if you have net income or a loss in your business, how long can you keep filing for your business? I, I heard that after three years, the government considers it a hobby. If you are self-employed, you really can't be filing a loss. I wouldn't even do it for one year or two years. You're going to subject yourself to the audit because the government, the IRS takes the position. Why would you go into business for yourself to lose money? So just be careful of that. Um, is there a way to create a SEP IRA if your business runs at a loss? Um, not necessarily. A SEP IRA is a deduction that you can take. It's a self-employed person's IRA. Uh, it's generally based upon as a percentage of the income that you generate from the business. So there are minimums you can do, but generally a SEP IRA is not going to help you very much. Uh, Judy says, can you deduct anything as an employee of the company? No, you cannot. There is no deduction for unreimbursed employee expenses anymore, Judy. Uh, Sandeep says, hey, can I deduct my work from home office expense as a W-2 employee? No, you really can't. Um, there's a high threshold you would have to meet to have a home office deduction. And that is not a deduction I would recommend in part because if you ever want to be audited, that's the surefire way to guarantee that they're going to audit you for that. Um, okay, so um, that's your first way, self-employed, uh, employee versus an independent contractor. Reduce your income by potentially being an independent contractor. Okay, here's another way. Um, maximize your retirement contributions to your 401k 
or 403B plan if you're a government employee, if you are an employee. What you're allowed to do with your retirement contributions by contributing, they are considered pre-tax contributions, meaning you're not paying any taxes on these contributions. What you're allowed to contribute as a maximum into your 401k or 403b every year, $20,500 that you can exclude from your income and it never even shows up as taxable. If you are 50 or older, you're allowed an extra $6,500 per year um, to contribute into your 401k or 403b. I would say contribute if you can, because this is a good way to minimize your income. And a lot of employers will match a certain portion of your contributions. If you have an employer that's going to maximize, um, excuse me, match any of your retirement contributions, absolutely do it as much as you can. They're essentially giving you free money at that point. And it's non-taxable at this point. So there's a tip for you. If you got an employer that's matching any of your 401k, 403b uh, uh, contributions, do it to the maximum. Um, Ryan says, this is only for pre-tax 401k, correct? Yes. So this is pre-tax. It is, they take it out of your gross wages. So therefore it doesn't even get uh, calculated as part of your gross wages when tax comes. Uh, Monsi says, is it inclusive, uh, inclusive of employer matching? It is inclusive of that employer match out there. So it's $20,500. Okay, what's the advantage of maximizing your retirement contributions? It's kind of a forced savings for retirement, right? How many of you want to be eating cat food when you retire? I don't want that to happen to you. Save for retirement. It's a great thing to do for right now. It reduces your gross income, and it ultimately reduces your amount of tax that you're going to pay. But there's a downside to this strategy, though. Smaller paycheck. They're taking money out of your paycheck and putting it into retirement. You're not going to get to spend that money. And you are not permitted to withdraw those funds until you retire. Um, and because if you withdraw those funds before retirement, and they calculate it at 59 and a half year, if you take the money out ahead of time, you're going to pay tax on it. And you're going to get hit with a 10% penalty for an early withdrawal. There are some limited exceptions why you can do it but don't count on it. So your money is stuck in there. You're really not going to be able to take it out. Um, Wendy says, can a cash value account linked with life insurance be considered a non-taxable retirement account? No, that does not qualify as a retirement account. It's got to be an official 401k, 403b, or an IRA, um, or like a 457 plan. Those are a, a sanctioned account as well. But otherwise, it, if it's not one of those, you really can't be doing things like that. Okay, so... Um, that's another way to reduce your income, maximize your retirement contributions, and then you won't have to eat cat food when you retire. Okay, so the next way we can do it, not reduce your income, let's increase your deductions now, because increased deductions will help reduce your taxable income as well. What are deductions? Deductions are statutory reductions to your gross income that help you determine your taxable income. Okay. Oh, Sandra's got a question here. If you contribute pre-tax to retirement now, you won't have to pay a higher tax rate later when you use that money. Not necessarily, Sandra. If you, when you go retire and you withdraw the money, it's considered income and it's going to be taxed at whatever your marginal tax rate is. The presumption is, is that when you're older and ready to retire, your income tax rate is going to be lower than what it is right now when you're maximizing your income right now. Um, Sheila's asking, is that $20,500 for married filing joint together? No, that's for each person. So each person can do $20,500 to maximize their 401k or 403b contributions. Okay, so let's go back to deductions. So we got these deductions here everyone gets the standard deduction. So everyone gets it. So it depends upon what your filing status is. If you're single, you get a standard deduction $12,950. If you're married to filing joint, you get a standard deduction of $25,900. If you're head of household, you get a standard deduction of $19,400. And if you're age 65 or older and or blind, you do get some additional standard deductions on top of these amounts everyone gets the standard deduction. But 
you want to compare it to your itemized deductions. Now, generally, personal expenses not deductible. However, the IRS has carved out certain personal expenses which you can serve as an itemized deduction that you can use. Medical expenses, if they exceed a certain percentage of your income, are deductible. Property taxes that you pay on your property, on your house that you own, those are deductible. Mortgage interest that you pay is an itemized deduction. Charitable contributions that you make are an itemized deduction. So what you do is you add up all of your itemized deductions here and you compare it to your standard deduction. Whichever one is greater, that's the one that you take on your taxes because it's gonna reduce your taxable income the most and reduce your taxes the most. Now, so always when you're doing your taxes, look at the standard deduction, but then look at these four primary things, medical expenses, property taxes, and state income taxes paid your mortgage interest and your charitable contributions and see if you have enough to itemize which are bigger than your standard deduction. Now, these standard deductions are granted based upon your filing status. Your itemized deductions are really dependent upon what your actual costs are. So it doesn't matter with your standard, your itemized deductions, whether you're single, you're married, kids, no kids, doesn't matter. It's, it's just the number calculations that we do. So here's a strategy for you to help minimize your taxes here. Buy a house. Now, I know your generation is not into buying big giant assets necessarily like my generation was, but there's a reason for it for buying a house. So let me put some numbers up here to help compare what itemized deductions and standard deductions would do and how it actually works. So let's assume you have a purchase price of a house of $500,000. I know in Orange County, that's not necessarily realistic, but let's just say it's a $500,000 purchase price. You have to take out a mortgage of $400,000. So the reason why is most banks require you to put at least 20% down as a cash payment, a cash down payment to buy a house before you get a mortgage. So $400,000 mortgage is 80%. Let's presume the interest rate is roughly 5%. I think a 30-year mortgage is about like 4.7 right now, but interest rates are going up. So let's just say a 5% um, mortgage uh, interest rate. So the mortgage interest that you would be paying on an annual basis, roughly $20,000. Roughly is your mortgage, okay? So then you got to pay property taxes too when you buy a house roughly 1.25% of your purchase price is what they calculate for property taxes. So your property taxes we would have here was $6,250. As a result, your total itemized deductions, $26,250. Now Sandeep is saying he bought a house this year, but it was not, at, it was at the end of the year, so it wasn't as high of a deduction. You're right. If you buy at the end of the year, Sandeep, you're not going to get the full advantage of it, but I guarantee you 2022 is going to be a big year for you on this. What's the standard deduction if you're married filing joint? $25,900. Look, buying the house, it resulted in a higher itemized deduction that's going to help reduce your taxes. So Chris is asking, do you think the standard deduction increasing in state income being capped decreased the appeal of buying a house? It does. Um, so there is a cap right now on the maximum taxes that you can deduct as an itemized deduction. It's capped at $10,000. And so with property taxes going up, state income taxes going up, you're going to be potentially capped there. But your mortgage interest is still going to provide you a pretty significant itemized deduction. So as he says, it does depend. You really want to do the calculations out there. So what's the benefit of buying a house? Hey, you're creating a valuable asset which appreciates over the long term. The history shows here, especially in California, property values increase over the long term. They may fluctuate like this in the short term. In the long term, it's generally an upward curve. Okay. There is a potential to itemize your deductions now to reduce your taxable income and your taxes. So Michael's saying the new Biden plan will raise the $10,000 limit that has been proposed. It's being championed by the Congress people from New York and New Jersey. 
Uh, I haven't seen our California congressmen uh, and senators jump onto that plan yet, but that's a proposal right now. Whether it gets passed or not, we don't know. Um, Lucia said, did the 10,000 homeowner limit? No, it's still $10,000. Sandeep's asking, does PMI, uh, basically that's the purchase mortgage interest insurance that you have to pay when you get a loan when you're not necessarily as highly qualified. PMI um, can be deducted potentially um, if it is structured correctly, and that would be part of your mortgage interest. Avery said, do you recommend the use of tax software to find all the itemized deductions? Um, tax software definitely helps you because there's a few more itemized deductions I haven't mentioned um, because they are not as common, but the tax software might help you. But these are the four big ones, medical expenses, prop state local taxes, property taxes, mortgage interest, and charitable contributions. Um, what are some downsides to buying a house? Big cash down payment. You got to have that 20% of your purchase price generally set as part of a cash down payment. And don't forget, you got monthly mortgage payments. You have semi-annual property tax payments that you have to pay now. So just be careful. You got to budget for those things as well. So um, Lucia is saying the $10,000 limit, that $10,000 limits on state local income taxes plus property taxes. It's not mortgage interest. You should be able to deduct all of your mortgage interest as well. Okay. So here's another strategy to help you increase your deductions. Make some charitable contributions. What you do is you get to deduct cash and non-cash contributions. And who do you have to make them to? Well, you have to make them to charitable organizations, maybe like the American Red Cross, United Way, maybe uh, Help for Ukraine right now is a big cause that you can get a deduction for. You can also donate to religious organizations like your church, your synagogue, your temple, your mosque. Um, those are considered charitable contributions. Heck, your UCI alumni, give some money back to us at the Paul Marash School of Business or at UCI. Those are considered charitable contributions. You can support your local school district, your local governments as well. All those qualify as um, charitable contributions as well. What are the benefits, the advantages of it? You're doing something good for your community and for society itself. It's a great thing to give back. I encourage everyone to give back as much as they can. Your UCI alumni, you guys had a great privilege to be here at UCI. We are the greatest public institution of higher learning this world has ever known, and you graduated from UCI. Don't forget how what a privilege you had do some community service or donate some money back. You have a potential to itemize your deductions now. So you get to reduce your taxable income and to reduce your taxes. But there are some downsides to charitable contributions. You're gonna have to give up some cash or give up some other property that you're donating. And this is the big one. The reduction of your taxes from charitable contributions is not a dollar for dollar reduction. Remember, it's a deduction to reduce your income to get to taxable income, and then they multiply your tax rate against that taxable income. So if you're, let's say, at a 20% tax rate and you make a $100 charitable contribution, it reduces your income by $100. Multiply that by 20% means it's only a reduction in your taxes for $20. So just keep that in mind. It's not a dollar for dollar reduction. Uh, someone's asking, um, are medical expenses, can you deduct it if you have an FSA, um, a family savings account, or an HSA, a health savings account? No, you cannot. Because HSA and FSA contributions are pre-tax contributions, and you're using it to pay your medical expenses, you don't get to deduct those medical expenses anymore. Okay. Um, Ryan's asking, is there a limit to charitable contributions? Generally, they, you, your total charitable contributions cannot exceed 60% of your adjusted gross income. That's where your limits can be placed upon, okay? Okay, so here's another way, another strategy. Let's lower your marginal tax rate now. Remember, with marginal tax rates, as your income goes up, your marginal tax rate increases as well. So how do we lower your mar marginal tax rate? Choose some tax-free investments. State and local municipal bonds or bond funds those are great investments in that the income that you earn from them, not subject to tax. We're not talking about United States Treasury bonds, though. It's state and local municipal bonds or bond funds. 
What are the advantages of it? Interest and dividends received are completely tax-free and your investment in government bonds are pretty secure. There's not, there's a very low risk to investing in government bonds. But there's a downside though. Government bonds pay low returns and low yields compared to private bonds or private stocks that you might be investing in. So just be careful, you're giving, uh, what you're getting in terms of tax savings, you're giving up in returns. So you may wanna do the calculation as to how much money you're giving up in interest and dividends versus how much you would save with those interest and dividends as well. Here's another way to lower your marginal tax rate, time the sale of your capital assets. What are capital assets? They're generally the big stuff. They're the big stuff that we invest in that we buy. So it could be your house. It could be investment or rental properties generally. It could be stocks and bonds. It could even be a yacht or a boat or a car or a plane or you know, a collection of antique furniture or a coin collection or a baseball card collection. Those are considered your capital assets. Now, if you hold those capital assets for less than one year and then you sell it, you're going to be subject to short-term capital gains. And short-term capital gains are taxed at the normal marginal tax rate. It's whatever your ordinary income is, you're just paying regular tax on it. But if you're able to hold that capital asset for at least one year or more, now you get long-term capital gain treatment. And long-term capital gain treatment is pretty cool because those tax rates are zero to 20% depending upon your income tax bracket. You potentially could sell a capital asset long-term and not pay any taxes on it. So the advantage of timing the sale of your capital assets is lower to potential no taxes on long-term capital gains. There's a downside to this though, decreased flexibility in the use of your assets. They're tied up in these things, in these capital assets. And if you're waiting a year to sell them, you may not be able to take advantage of a hot new opportunity that comes along right away. So be careful on that as well. Here's another one. If you own a house, live in your house for at least two years. Because if you live in your house for at least two years, each person who qualifies gets a $250,000 exclusion from their capital gains, which is not taxed. It's a great thing to get. So the advantage of this one is your home is your biggest asset. And what you get to do is you get to exclude um, a big portion of a capital gain from taxes. But the downside to this, again, is that it, you must own and live in this house for at least two years before you can take advantage of that. And because of that two-year requirement, you have some decreased flexibility in what you can do with your asset. Maybe the market's doing great and you get a great offer on the house, but you can't sell it because you're waiting that two-year period. So just kind of keep that part in mind. Okay, here's another strategy for you get married. <laughs> now, I, I've heard that your generation, not big fans of marriage, like my generation was, but I'm going to give you a reason to get married, and it's going to be for taxes. So let's do a comparison here of two people who file single versus two people who file as married joint. So let's say there's some wages. We're going to take away a standard deduction. We'll calculate the taxable income. You'll owe some federal taxes out there. So let's say we got two people who are single. Person number one earns $120,000 in wages. Person number two earns $180,000 in wages, okay? So each of them will get the single person standard deduction, $12,950, and they're gonna have taxable income for person number one of $107,050, person number two, $167,050. If we go calculate their federal taxes, I did the calculations for you. Person number one would owe $19,713 in taxes. Person number two would owe $34,283 in taxes. And so if you add those two numbers together, it'd be $53,996.
let's see how much tax they would owe if they had filed as married filing joint. So we're gonna add up the total wages earned, 300,000 now, add up their standard deductions, $25,900, taxable income, $274,100, and the federal taxes they would owe, I did the calculation for you, $53,826. Now you can see that there is a lower tax amount, but you might say oh, 170 bucks, big deal. Well, I will tell you the difference gets starker as the income levels go up. And you're UCI graduates, we're gonna be expecting that you are gonna be in these higher income tax brackets. So getting married is going to help reduce the amount of taxes that you would have paid together. Victoria says, hey, is there any reason to file married separately? The short answer, no, don't ever do it. Don't file married separately. There is absolutely, there is a penalty for doing that and that you will pay higher taxes on almost everything because you're married filing separate. So just based on these tax numbers alone, have I convinced any of you to maybe go get on one knee and propose to your significant other tonight? <laughs> so think about it. Getting married is a good reason. Well, get married for love, please. But tax savings is another reason you can get married. You generally will save some money. Now, notice these numbers are really based upon a higher income that they're earning. If you're in lower income earning, that you're maybe are not going to be saving by filing, uh, by getting married at that point. But again, we're expecting you're going to be in these higher tax brackets at some point. Okay. Um, so Chris is getting married in a few months, but he says it's not for taxes, but perhaps it is. Um, Jacqueline say, hey, what if your significant other requires a visa? How would you file? Um, once they are married, you are married, you can still file a married joint. You are permitted to do that. Uh, are there advantages to getting married versus a California domestic partnership? Um, if you are not married, um, you got to be careful because the IRS may not allow you to file a joint tax return. There are very specific rules that have to be met before you can file as a married joint. California would recognize you as married, but the IRS may not. Um, Ryan, it makes no difference if you have a prenup or not. It makes no difference in filing married joint. Okay. Prenups are kind of funny. I think that um, I just imagine the conversations that one spouse asks the other spouse, hey, will you sign a prenup? Okay, there's one final thing I want to talk to you about on strategies to minimize your taxes. We're going to utilize some of these tax credits. So there are tax credits out there. And what are tax credits? They are dollar for dollar reductions of tax owed. They're not deductions. Deductions are dollar for dollar reductions of income which is then multiplied by tax rates. Tax credits are way more valuable because they reduce dollar for dollar your taxes owed. And there are certain tax credits that are put in place by the government because they're trying to achieve some type of social purpose or some important purpose that they've identified. And there's lots of tax credits out there. But I pulled out four of them that I thought might be relevant to you all. So the first one, uh, five of them actually, the American Opportunity Credit what this does is it gives you a $2,500 tax credit per student for the first four years of post-secondary education. So, so long as you meet some qualification requirements on how much you spent on tuition, you potentially are gonna get a $2,500 tax credit per each student. And it's for the first four years of post-secondary education. Compare that to another education credit called the lifetime learning credit. What this does, it's a little less generous. It's 2,000 per tax return, not based on the number of students. It's 2,000 for the whole tax return, depending on how much you spent on your tuition. Um, and it's for an unlimited period of time. You're not limited to the first four years of post-secondary education. Those are two credits to think about um, to help you reduce your taxes. There's something called the earned income credit. The earned income credit is meant to help lower income individuals, and it's ultimately based upon the number of children or dependents that you support. Generally, if you have three or more children, married filing joint, it's available if you have 57,000 of income or below. If you're any other filing status, it's about 51,000 or below. Or if you have no children you're supporting, lower than 27,000 roughly if you're filing married joint in income. 21,000 if you have uh, any other filing status. 
it's a pretty generous credit. If you have three or more children, the government's going to give you $6,728 as a tax credit to reduce your taxes or to generate a refund for you. If you have no children, the government gives you $1,502 as a credit to help reduce your taxes or to give you a refund. Uh, Sandeep says, hey, the lifetime learning credit is good for taking courses at the community college. Absolutely, it's good for that. Absolutely. You'd always want to use your American Opportunity Credit for the first four years. And then when you're in a fifth year now or subsequent, you then switch to the lifetime learning credit. Here's another good credit that's out there, your solar power tax credit. If you decide to put solar panels on your house and you do it this year, they'll give you a tax credit for 26% of your total equipment cost uh, in putting those solar panels up. If you do it next year, it drops to 22% for the total amount of equipment that you placed in service. Um, still a pretty valuable credit to help you subsidize solar panels. I'll tell you, we put solar panels on our house um, and we basically have no energy bills at this point because of the solar panels and we have an electric vehicle and it's charged pretty much all for free. Okay. Uh, Sandeep is saying, uh, well, Sandeep, if your dad used it when you were a student, then it's already been used up. So it's per, based on per student first four years of post-secondary. So if a family member you were claimed as a dependent used it on their tax return, you don't get to use that anymore. Uh, someone's asking, does it matter the type of education for the lifetime learning credit? No, it doesn't matter as long as it's post-secondary um, after high school. It could be trade school. It could be culinary school. It could be for um, a program to, you know, reinvigorate your skills or to learn a new skill. All that's available for lifetime learning credit. Um, Brittany, you do not have to be in school full-time for the lifetime learning credit. American Opportunity Credit, you have to be full-time for at least half the year. One final credit I want to talk to you about, it's the all-electric and hybrid vehicle tax credit. If you buy an all-electric or hybrid vehicle, guess what? $7,500 tax credit that you can take off of your taxes. $7,500. But if you buy a Tesla, you don't get it because all the credits are gone for Tesla. If you buy a GM vehicle, like the Bolt or the Volt, don't get it at all. That tax credit's gone for those vehicles as well. But all the other ones are out there um, where you get a $7,500 tax credit for it. Um, Wesley says, get married, lose potentially half or more of your net worth if you divorce. And if you don't prenup, forget it. Well, Wesley, I... I'd hope we're not all that cynical about it. Um, before you get married, please pick carefully. Um, I deal with clients who did not pick carefully, so it's not a pleasant thing. Um, don't get married just for the tax benefits of it. Pick carefully, do it for love if you can. Um, so uh, let's see, um, that's my presentation on strategies to reduce taxes. Now we can take, some, we have a few minutes left to take some questions. Uh, does it have to be a new electric or hybrid car? Yes, it does, because if it's not new, it means the prior individual who owned the car has taken that credit as well. Can you give an example of an all electrical electric vehicle um, like the Tesla, all Teslas, but that credit's gone, an Audi e-tron is all electric. Um, I think the BMW i3 is all electric, the Chevy Volt or the Chevy, uh, the, uh, the successor, that's all electric um, as well. So one final question I did not get a chance to answer. How do I borrow against my stocks for everyday spending? Um, you can certainly do that if you're able to find a brokerage house that's willing to loan you money off of your stocks. Um, just keep in mind, it is a loan. You're going to have to repay it. Um, yeah, you don't have to pay income taxes on it, but you got to ultimately repay that loan. I, it's not a strategy I would necessarily recommend. Judy's saying, how do you avoid getting audited? Um, be honest in the reporting of your taxes. Don't play games with the IRS uh, because an audit's not a pleasant thing to go through. Uh, Cy says Honda Clarity. That was another plug-in hybrid. That does work uh, as well. What do you need if you get audited? I hope you keep really good records because the IRS is going to want to see those records to substantiate the deductions that you take. Bryce says the Rivian is one uh, as well. The new Lucid out there are all electric vehicles as well. Uh, Wesley has a good idea. Be rich. Well, financially rich and be healthy rich and be um, happy rich. Um, 
Also hire a good accountant. Um, good accountants can guide you and help you prepare your taxes and help you identify legal strategies to minimize your income or to maximize your deductions. Can we say how long should we keep the records for tax purposes? Seven years. Seven years is the audit period. Once seven years has passed from the filing of that tax return, you can toss those old records, shred them please, because uh, of identity theft. What do you wanna look for in a good accountant? I would not shop by accountants on rate alone. Cheaper ones are not very good because there's a reason they're charging you that low. So be careful of that. Talk to friends, get some recommendations on people they've used or people they trust. Uh, if, you need, uh, if you start a new side business and don't earn more than your expenses, could you then expense your additional losses against your regular wages? <sighs> Technically, yes. But again, I'm going to warn you, IRS is not going to be happy with you if you start your own business and generate losses because they're going to believe that you are faking a lot of those losses because why do people go into business to lose money? Um, let's see. Rebecca says, if you didn't claim the electric or hybrid car credit this year, can you claim it the following year? No, you have to go amend your taxes and file it in the year that you purchased it. Uh, Avery says, we have a very straightforward taxes. Would you still recommend getting an accountant? If you're able to master TurboTax and get through it, I don't have a problem with TurboTax, but I think once you start having capital gains or you start taking withdrawals from your pension or retirement accounts, or you have some odd types of income, you may want to think about getting an accountant at that point. Ryan's asking, how much is it average for a good, how much to pay? Um, a lot of CPAs will charge based upon your income. Um, if you're at a lower income level, probably like three, 400 bucks would be reasonable. Higher income levels, eight to a thousand potentially. Victoria says, can you write off stuff for being an independent contractor if you also have a full-time position? Sure, absolutely. If you're receiving 1099 self-employment income, you are entitled to offset all of your business-related expenses against that. Do you get taxed for borrowing against your 401k? Judy asks, no, you actually don't. Um, you are permitted to borrow against it as long as you repay that loan. If you don't repay it, then it becomes income. Ariane says, just got married, changed my last name. I file in my new name. Should I be okay? Yeah. Because the social, as long as you've registered it with Social Security Administration, they have a record of your name. I wouldn't worry about that. Goldie says, hey, for HSA contributions, could you talk about HSA last month rules? I'm confused about the eligibility rules. I, I was eligible through an employer plan, but left that job and stopped contributing. Is there any penalties because of that? No, there's actually not. What would happen is that HSA account does not disappear. It still exists out there. It just transfers to a new administrator. You're still allowed it's to... Uh, pay for medical expenses through it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> uh, I would be happy to do more workshops for the UCI alumni. I don't know if you want to sit here and talk, hear me talk about taxes for another hour, but yes, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you for saying that. Um, Jacqueline says she uses TurboTax. Are there other similar services? Um, TurboTax is the most common one. There are a couple other smaller services that would do it. Um, IRS allows you to file your taxes generally for free. Uh, if you can get into their system and figure it out, if it's pretty simple, California allows it as well to file your taxes. TurboTax is not a bad piece of software. But again, if it gets too complicated, uh, I think about hiring an account. Okay, so we're over time. Thanks for all being here. I appreciate you all listening to me. Um, uh, we're going to post these slides out there. So um, if you have questions, you can know how to find me at the Mirage School. I'm generally pretty responsive to things. Um, so thanks for all being here. I appreciate it. I'll turn yeah. it back over to you, Chris. Max, I just want to close this up and say, hey, it's very clear why you were the uh, lecturer of the year twice. Um, if you can make taxes this interesting and informative, um, that says a lot. So I just want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for answering all these questions. We do do quarterly events like taxes, like other things, we've done stocks, we've done crypto. So mm -hmm. keep an eye out. There's an events calendar coming up on April 7th. There's a What Matters to Me and Why with Aaron Gruel at the Newkirk Alumni Center. On April 21st, there is a higher UCI alumni career fair in Los Angeles. Um, but if you're interested in finding out any more information on events, just contact alumni at uci.edu. You can find out about the, the Young Alumni Council and some of the events that we put on. We're very helpful that all of you showed out. And with that said, thank you, Max. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great night.